Hello, everyone, and welcome to CCA's Medical Minute podcast. I'm Sherry Hughes, and today uh, joining me to talk about bilateral retinoblastoma is our director of precision oncology, Andy Gilligundo, and a special guest, Shana Flannery. Welcome, Shana. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for Welcome. having me. Yeah, I'm so glad to, to be here with Shana. And you are a cancer survivor, and first and foremost, we want to put that out there. Um, but we also want to talk about bilateral retinoblastoma because that uh, was the cancer that you were diagnosed with when you were just a kid, correct? Yes, absolutely. I was five months old when I was initially diagnosed. Five months old, and now you're 20-something. 20 27, <laughs> yes. This past summer was my 25-year anniversary of being cancer-free. And you know what? I When we first met and we talked and you told me that you were a cancer survivor too, I knew that we had to have this conversation today. And your type of cancer is what they consider, Andy, as a childhood type cancer, bilateral retinoblastoma, bilateral meaning both of the eyes. eyes, It's a rare eye cancer. But I think the fact that she's, you know, was was just a baby and now she's 20 something years old, that is because of science, because of what we know and research. So Andy, you're you're the precision oncology guy, the gene guy. Yeah. There is a gene associated with uh, this particular. There is, and um, you know, str- strangely enough, it's RB1, which stands for retinoblastoma one. So sometimes it's it's easy. They name the the uh, you know like BRCA, mm. breast cancer. Right. RB is retinoblastoma. Um, so this is what we call an autosomal dominant gene, mm. meaning that uh, if you get one copy from one parent, which is a coin flip, right? Uh, you, you could have as high as 90% risk of getting the disease. Now, not everyone uh, gets retinoblastoma because they have a gene mutation. In mm-hmm. fact, 60%, so most patients with retinoblastoma uh, don't have it on uh, you know, due to a mutation. So yeah. I, I understand that was the case. In your case, that was yeah. that was Yeah, what it was actually, a, uh, they believe it was a spontaneous mutation in myself because I don't have any family members that mm-hmm. have had retinoblastoma. Um, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe if it's in both eyes, it's always genetic. And if it's a spontaneous um, retinoblastoma mm-hmm. growth, it would just be in one eye. So there's It's, it's not like always okay. a genetic, uh, but, but mostly. Sure. And weirdly enough, so they call it bilateral because there's two eyes. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you were to look this up, they actually have what they call trilateral and you're like wait a minute i only have two, I, have two eyes. I only have two <laughs> eyes what does trilateral right. mean the third spot it would be in within the cranium within mm-hmm. that same space oh, so the two eyes and then in the space within the skull so that's a, a trilateral but yeah so you can have a spontaneous uh mutation in fact you know lots of uh you know cancers be it you know like common cancers mm-hmm. lung cancers breast cancers have a spontaneous mutation within the tumor itself which isn't passed on to mm-hmm. uh, to uh, you know, to family members, but can cause the disease itself. Mm-hmm. So. so, so some folks would think, okay, so this is something that you had as a child, and so um, you know what? Obviously, you've been cured and you're doing well. But that kind of survivorship is not just that cut and dry. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your experience from what you know or were told as a, you know with this uh, eye disease as a child, and how you. Um, matriculated, how you grew through all the years and all the things that you've had to be aware of and to do. Absolutely. So thankfully, I was, well, thankfully for me, I was young enough that I don't remember any of my treatment. So I was diagnosed when I was five months old and in treatment until I was two. Um, So I don't have any of the Mm. kind of mental health issues that a lot of childhood cancer survivors have. But um, I think being a cancer survivor at any age, any stage Mm -hmm. of life, um, there's always things to deal with after that medically, um, but also just in the way that you choose to live your life and the way that you spend your time. And yeah. I have chosen to invest a lot of my time and energy in nonprofit work and focusing mm-hmm. on oncology um, awareness and research and things like that. So I think that that is probably the biggest yeah. um, experience as a survivor that I've chosen to kind of dive into. Um, medically, I have. Mm-hmm quite a few doctor's appointments every year that I have to go have checkups with. Um, Thankfully, everything's been clear and healthy ever since um, my treatment has concluded. Now, you did lose an eye. I did. um, 
vision in one eye yes you would never know it but you know that's something too that you've had to you know come to terms with and so how do you you know how do you handle that from a child do you even remember it or do, you know you're you've been seeing through the vision of one eye and so how does that affect you impact your life today yeah well just given the fact that i didn't include that in my last answer <laughs> tells you that it's um just kind of second nature to me i was five months old when they removed my eye mm -hmm. um and they did that because it was just fully consumed with tumors um so i don't remember anything mm -hmm. differently so it doesn't necessarily affect um, my life. I think there's some times that I will knock over a glass of water or mm -hmm. something like that. And I don't think that it's because of my lack of vision, but it definitely is. Yeah. Um, so I think the only restriction that I've been told is that I can't fly fighter planes. Yeah. So well, that's okay. obviously affecting my life in Darn a big it. way. <laughs> Darn it. When, when I knock over the glasses, cause I'm clumsy. Uh, <laughs> so, so Andy, um, is there, based on your knowledge, is, I mean, for for parents or for someone that may be concerned with, you know, an eye cancer like this, is, is there any recourse or something that they can do? Even if you have a small child and someone's listening to our podcast, um, I, I would imagine this, uh, there are some symptoms of, of, of some sort? I, I, I think there would be. Uh, you know, even, you know, uh, a, a, a five-month-old, mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, this it, it's a little bit easier if a parent has had other children, right? So they know. Wait a minute, little Joey never had that issue, you know, uh -huh. and they, so they can sell, say differences. And sometimes differences are just differences within kids, but sometimes differences are that something's fishy going yeah. on here. And mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's this isn't very scientific, and so very maybe not very precision of me to say. Mm -hmm. But um, you gotta you gotta sometimes listen to your parental instincts right. that, that say. Something's not quite right. Uh, with, you know? uh, with with all, I think, you know, like early detection, you know what these things are. But if you sense that your child, you know, um, is having some vision issues right. or, you know, that maybe the pupils, or discomfort, or, discomfort or, yeah. or whatever, you take yeah. them in early. Or if you know that you have a, a family predisposition, of course. Of course. And so for you, you said there was none of that. But. How have you been able to, you know, you say you have uh, doctor's appointments and things of that. You've been having that all of your life. Walk us through that. What is that like? Yeah, um, I have been blessed with the absolute best of care in all aspects. I have um, an ocularist, which makes the prosthetic that I wear every day. Mm -hmm. I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, I still see a childhood oncologist mm -hmm. every year. Um, I believe that's that's the list these days um, and then just a normal eye doctor um, so how did, how did they diagnose it in you yeah that I was just gonna just <laughs> yeah, I'm that. sorry that yeah, I stole no, your I thunder like okay, thank <laughs> you. I'm being it curious was, like <laughs> it was kind of um, parental intuition a little bit mm -hmm. it was it's actually a, a really cool story um, it was Christmas Eve when I was five months old so 1997 mm -hmm. um, my parents brought me to mass we were with the whole family christmas eve my dad was holding me and the way that the lights were shining from the ceiling in the church were um making my people look white oh yeah instead gave of, <laughs> that's instead what i was curious about black. Yes. yeah so um i believe that that was my dad actually seeing the tumor uh -huh. on my retina instead of yeah. normally obviously when yes. you look in someone's eyes you see just black um, so they thought that that was obviously kind of weird, mm -hmm. brought me home after church and, um, did some kind of tests. They would cover, um, my bad eye that, mm -hmm. that was appearing white, which is my right eye. And I didn't, didn't react, didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And then they would cover my left eye and I would throw my head and I was right. acting like I couldn't see at all. Mm -hmm. So even at that point, I wasn't having any vision out of my right eye. I call that divine intervention. Yes. <laughs> in in you church, were, huh? You were in the <laughs> church and then they saw a white oh light gosh. in your eye. Yeah. I mean, you know, but that's one of the things that I read that doctors I, I, I read that for. same thing, you know, uh -huh. and, I, and I, I tell you, um, you know, it, in the 80s and 90s when we had the, the old style cameras mm -hmm. that took these big bright flashes yeah. that's what people would would notice it because mm -hmm. you know that it, it would cause the red eye right but the phenomena that you would get back that picture and baby's eye looks white in one of them yeah. maybe one's red one's white mm -hmm. uh 
you know, it, it, our, our phones are so advanced now they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll take out the red eye exactly. or, or the flash isn't quite the same. So it, it, we kind of lose that. But it does bring that back to point, though. Bring your babies yeah. in for their well checks Absolutely. because they do these reflex yeah. tests and, and eye checks you know, kind of, you know, routinely, mm -hmm. and they would see that. I'm glad Absolutely. you mentioned the red eye because some people, you know, they tend to think, why did we see this red eye when we take a picture? But that's because of the red blood Ref vessels. Yeah, the reflection of, of right, the, of the right, back right, of the right. retina. So again, yeah. if you see anything other than red, uh, you see something white or does, that can alert you to something just isn't right because you never, you rarely see that, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. So, so, so Shana, your, your message now, um, it's not lost on you, as I said earlier, or that when oftentimes, because I'm a, a breast cancer survivor, um, oftentimes we're thinking of the big fives, you know, the, the the huge cancers that people hear about all the time, like the prostate, the breast, the the lung, the colon, skin, and, and pancreatic. But I think we've seen more than 40 somewhat cancers um, that our docs have seen here, but all cancers are cancer. And um, that means that, you know, to be a survivor as a breast cancer survivor is there's there's the same type of joy and and gratefulness from ev any kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think we kind of like connected because you were quick to share that, you know. And so do you share that with other people? Yeah, absolutely. I'm very, very open about my story. I think that there's a lot of benefit to sharing mm -hmm. a story like mine, um, not only to emphasize the um, appreciation that I have for life and um, trying to kind of share that positive note, mm. but increase awareness of childhood cancers and not only from a prevention standpoint like mm -hmm. this, um, but also getting more awareness and funding for research and things like that. It's really, really important to me because um, like you said, everyone mm, thinks yeah. about the big five, the, the adult cancers that are unfortunately so common that we see so often, um, but there are hundreds of types of childhood cancer um, and cancers of, mm -hmm. of all ages that um, are rare enough that are not spoken about. Yeah. And it's yeah. really important to, for people to be aware of those things for their own safety exactly. and well-being, but then also for the progress of oncology in general. Yes, well, we're getting ready to wrap this up with Andy. I wanna ask you from a precision oncology uh, standpoint, you know, do people ask when they say I want a genetic testing? Can you, you know, the panels are wide range. Right. Is, is this particular genetic mutation a part of that or does it pick up, you know? Yeah, no, it's actually a pretty common to be in a multi-gene panel. So nowadays it's, it's almost the uh, default standard to check a, a wide panel on, you know, oh, you have breast cancer, we're gonna check this panel of 50 mm -hmm. genes. Well, only about a dozen of them have to do with breast cancer, and then they check all these other common, and then some less common ones that, yes. like RB1, that happens mm -hmm. to be included on, on most of these panels. Uh, but what I would say is, though, in, in, in terms of the general population, thinking about do I need you know hereditary genetic testing, it, it goes back to the same mm -hmm. questions we ask for breast cancer and colon cancer, the, you know, the prostate cancer, the common ones that are thought of as hereditary is, look at your family history mm -hmm. you know and um you know if you have a you know a rare cancers or you know maybe not so rare but they happen in a weird way so right. you have a breast cancer for example that's happening in a 25 year old yeah. mm -hmm. that's not normal so those are things that say well you need to <laughs> maybe check that genetics mm -hmm. uh so those are all things that that you follow the same rules of thumb even for these rare diseases it's like well, why did that rare disease happen? Well, geez, you know, grandpa, you know, you know, died in right. the you know '90s, and so and he had his disease, you know, in the '80s. Yeah, we we yeah. weren't doing genetic That's testing why. then, mm -hmm. and so even if it's a rare disease, maybe you should go back and think, well, what disease was that exactly, and yeah. do, is that something that we that we need to test for? Yeah. Thank you, Andy and Shana. To wrap this up, um, you're doing great now, and are your is are your doctor's appointments le uh, decreasing <laughs> at yes. all? Yes, absolutely. Um, I actually just had that conversation with my mm -hmm. oncologist the last time I saw her. That um, it's been an annual checkup my whole life, and now we're looking at doing two years or maybe five years, which is yes, awesome. really exciting. That's um, so exciting! And yeah, again, <laughs> just kind of speaks to the care that I have received and still receive i have stellar doctors mm, yeah. um my main treatment was at chop now all of my f 
uh, follow up is at Cincinnati Children's. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're well. Wonderful. Congratulations, Survivor! Keep thank surviving. You. Thank you. Okay. You too. Thank you, and thank you for being here, Andy. Thank you for joining us Thanks and for talking about all things precision oncology genetics. Thank you all for being here on this Medical Minute. Please subscribe to it and share it, and we'll see you again the next time.